So Tyler, are you, oh, there we go. Yeah, oh, sorry, okay. All right, welcome SciCommerce. Uh, science communication is more than just sharing information. You have to build trust with your audience by forging connections with them. And today we have Laura Lindenfeld, Executive Director of the Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science, here to chat about how improv holds valuable keys to successful science communication. Uh, Laura, the floor is yours. Oh my goodness, um, so nice to meet everybody. Marianne, how are you? Nice to see you. Great to see you, Laura. I'm very psyched to have you here with SciCommerce. Oh, I'm thrilled. And I'd really, before I dig in, I would just like to know a little bit more about who's on this call and why you care about SciCom. If, if you want to put a note in the chat or even better, if you just want to speak up, I'd love to have a sense of, I think, to me, communication, and you'll hear this as a recurring theme, is about connecting not about transporting information. It's really about making connections with. So I wanna get a sense of who you are and why this matters to you. Anybody willing to jump in? I'll start to make it easy for everyone. Uh, I'm Tyler. I am uh, the program coordinator for the SciCommerce. Um, uh, and I care about science communication in general just because I like to help people tell their own science stories and tell science stories uh, on my own end. Um, and I'm especially excited for this mentor chat, like all of them, because I, um, have done, uh, improv, um, before the pandemic, um, and I currently, uh, teach stand-up at my local improv theater, so this is all very specific cool. for me. <laughs> How about others? Just give me a sense of your backgrounds. What are you... Hello. You go, Andrea. Yeah. Uh, I'm Andrea. I'm a scientist by training, but I have moved more and more into the SciCom world. I used to be a professor and figured science communication, right? I'm just doing it in front of students. And then I changed audiences. I now work in the federal government in a communications office for an agency. Um, and now it's my day job. And what's your scientific background? Neuroscience. Oh, neuroscience. That's what my husband does too. Very cool. Who else? This is helpful. It gives me a little sense. Ben, I see you have your camera on. Would you be willing to? Sure. Yeah, sure thing. Um, uh, so I'm a postdoc and I work now in like machine learning techniques and data science uh, and conservation biology and radiology. Um, but I've been, I kind of feel like interested in SciCom my whole life and it came more tuition during my like PhD work. Uh, I took an improv for a scientist class right before the pandemic and have just kept up with improv since then. We'll actually be taking over that class uh, coming uh, fall time, which will be fun. And uh, also have started making this uh, workshop humor and science and uh, trying to get that rolling too. Awesome. Wonderful. Anybody else? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, my name is Kristen Huck. I have been, I'm a biologist by training and I've been communicating science for the last 15 years. Um, first as a middle school science teacher, then as a grad student, then as a postdoc. And then um, I jumped into the policy world and worked for a federal agency um, communicating science to policy makers. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's really important to maintain scientific literacy, especially for people who are um, legislating. Uh, and I am familiar with improv um, and the link, but it's been a while since I've kind of talked about that. So that's why I wanted to come to this. Right. Also very cool title oh, yeah. that you, you do stand up. <laughs> awesome. I see I have a comment in here. I, and I'm with you, Tyler. Ben, that science and humor workshop sounds awesome <laughs> um there's another one making science more accessible current grad student in entomology first person to go to college in the family effective science communication played a big role wonderful wonderful anybody else before so i get i get it like you're all really interested in science communication you have more training than the average bear in improv which i think is phenomenal and you have relatively different backgrounds is that fair to say Okay. I want to make this. I want to make this go. Go ahead. Was there? 
Oh, I was just going to introduce myself. <laughs> yeah, please do. I love it. Okay. Yeah. I'm a PhD student in neuroscience and I'm very new to this. And I feel like I'm just kind of exploring and I just want to kind of see what SciComm is all about. But I recently attended a webinar um, put on by Research for America. And this was like recommended as a resource. So I'm just dipping my toes here and trying to see what is out there. Yeah. Terrific. I'm actually going to pull a book out of my nifty bag over here. Oh, thank you for posting. This is good. It just, you know, if everybody had the exact same background and I talked about something, you know, that would be really boring and a waste of your time. And that is one thing I hate to do is waste people's time. So maybe should I just tell you a little bit about myself? my background and what I'm doing here at the Allen Alda Center. So I'm a communication researcher and I actually came into science communication by studying food and the environment. I mean, if you study food long enough, it leads you to some place on the earth and you can't, I don't know how you can get involved with food studies and not somehow care about environmental issues. They're so inextricably linked. <clears throat> and as a person with the background in communication and cultural studies, I understand communication to be, it's like a clay that we collaboratively shape that um, both we contribute to designing, but also shapes who we are. And I really firmly believe that communication shapes our experience of the world as we shape it. So it's not like we just show up de novo in the world and we experience it brand new. We have to do that through communication. And that really is embedded in culture. So coming from communication and cultural studies, you can, you can imagine that when I started looking at, I, I started looking at interdisciplinary teams and how they collaborate. And that was fascinating because I thought, oh, this is going to be great. All these scientists from different backgrounds, they're going to get along and be problem solvers together. And how neat to bring, you know, ecology and economics and engineering together, they're going to solve the world's problems. And what do you think I saw? Imagine a $20 million NSF grant. How did it work? What do you think? Anybody want to venture a guess? Yeah, I shouldn't laugh, but I'm sure, I'm sure it wasn't what you were hoping for. <laughs> I was like, wow, these people need a treatment. <laughs> they don't know how to listen to each other. I couldn't believe it. And I think I was naive to believe like, oh, yes, if you're trained in science, it will be very easy to understand someone else to science that's different from yours, but be able to find common ground. Oh, wow. So you no know, power dynamics and who gets more money. It was all of that and more. And I really turned my whole research agenda toward that because I realized, boy, if we're going to make a difference in the, the, the really large societally pressing areas of challenge, that requires science and that require us to think across disciplines, we need some help with communication. So I started looking around, this was 2014, what's out there that could help people communicate better? And at the time, this website came up, the Center for Communicating Science. It did not have Alan Alda's name on it. And I started reading it and I thought, oh my gosh, this is it using improv to help people connect as human beings. It totally made sense to me because it, it makes that assumption that communication isn't this thing we translate beautifully from one person to the other, that there's all kinds of power dynamics and hierarchies and challenges and cultural proclivities and value systems that shape how we experience the world through and with communication. And then I saw that Alan Alda's name, I actually told him this when I got the job, I said, and then I saw that your name was associated with it. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. But that wouldn't have persuaded me to do it. It's like the idea itself was so robust of using improv to help scientists communicate. And it turns out improv helps all of us communicate more effectively. So let me ask you, I can see a number of you, um, a lot of, a lot of people in the biology fields, marine biology and others on here. Thank you so much for putting that in. It gives me an even better context. Why do you think improv is such a great tool to help scientists communicate? What's been your experience of that? Those of you who, who do improv yourselves or who have done an improv workshop? Or, or trained scientists? Yeah, Marietta, let me hear what you think. Well, I'll tell someone out there. I, I think 
improv really makes me, well, I haven't done a lot, but with, with you guys, improv makes you listen, listen and react to the person in a real way, which I love about it. Yeah, that's really the, the key thing that we're after. Let me get a couple more responses and then I'll come back to that. Why else is improv good for science communication? Yeah. Um, for me, I think about, again, I think about my time as a professor as paralleling my like high school time in drama club. Like you, when you're, when you're in a position as a scientist sort of talking to an audience, it feels to me like a performance and you have to change that performance depending on your audience. Like the way I would speak to a group of college students is different than how I would speak to, say, my peers in the lab if I was giving a, a talk on my data or different from how I would talk to, you know, fifth graders who were there for like an outreach day to learn about brains. And it, it to me, always felt like when I'm explaining science, I'm wearing that same performance hat as if I was in drama club. It's so cool. Yeah, I think drama club is a is a great thing for people who want to go into science to do. And that sounds kind of weird. You would think it would be the opposite. Have any of you, um, as those of you who have engaged with, with improv or other forms of theater, how about creativity? What does improv have to do with creativity? Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna share my thoughts too. I think ahead, the improv for scientists course I took just, made me a lot more comfortable with chaos and <laughs> life is chaos so just knowing that whatever that i'm in right now will pass uh is very useful and i mean science is just pretty much that every single day yeah yeah and being able to find some um some through lines through things that seem like chaos but actually can be explained being able to, to find meaning within something that, that seems chaotic, but may not actually be. So Marianne, let me come back to your, uh, by the way, thank you for rolling with me. We are actually doing improv right now. <laughs> you do improv all the time. We show, when we come into workshops, can you imagine you walk in and I've got half of my team as people with MFAs in theater and the other half is people like me, like with a PhD in communication or, or journalism or mass communication and everybody's sitting in the room. Have any of you done trainings with scientists and they're like, we're gonna do improv, this is gonna suck. They're gonna put me on a stage. And then we show them a slide and we say, this could be you this morning having a cup of coffee. You're improvising over coffee. You're, you're making the scenes of life go forward. <laughs> and improvising. So when we use the term improvisation in the Alda Center, we do not mean stand up. And what's very funny is typically in the room and myself included, like 10% of the people would be like, damn, I really want to learn how to do stand up, but that's not, that's not what, that's not what we're after. <clears throat> it could be stamp, stand up as a particular form of, of improv, of theater, we're also not necessarily talking about humor. We could be, if you're naturally someone who brings humor to the table, what we're talking about is creating genuine human connections. Really human to human, and we start with interpersonal uh, experiences, a lot of, how many of you, can I see either a direct show of hands or if you can use your, raise your hand, how many of you have done any kind of improv training or, or experience. Okay, so a number of you, not everybody, but a number. Um, can I ask those of you who have had some improv, what did it feel like? Give me a little bit of the sense of the improv you've done and what, what it felt like. So when I started improv, it was definitely, uh, terrifying to take uh, Haley's word from the chat um, because like I didn't know what it was for and I assumed like oh well I have to be funny and everyone else here is funny or um, what if I say the wrong thing and technically there is no wrong thing to say in improv uh, which is what I learned in improv because 
it's about creating and improv is great because it exists, not because it fulfills anything else other than just being in the world as something that you've made with someone else or yourself. Yeah, that's a great description. I'm sure others of you who have done any work in improv. So let's come back to this improv terrifies me. <laughs> that's typically how scientists react when we walk in the room, except for that, you know, 10% who are like, put me on the stage, I can't wait. <laughs> um, but really what we're talking about is making connections. So if you, has, that, has anyone other than Marriott been through an Alda workshop? Any of you done one of our workshops? You did one? Oh, where did you where did you do it, Tyler? Online or in person? I did one in person at the Eastern Branch uh, Entomolo Entomological Society of America conference a couple of years back. Okay. I think like 2018, 2019. And was it a short one, like an hour, or was it a full day? It was an hour. It was about an hour and a half. Okay. And you said, Marianne said, yeah, she had all of the Scientific American editors give it a try. We had such a nice partnership with you there too for a while. So I want you to imagine, maybe I, maybe if I describe a little bit what it feels like to be in the room, just to give you a sense, would that be helpful? Yes, okay. So I want you to imagine it's an eight hour day you've signed up for and you walk in and there are 16 of you and you're looking around thinking, what the heck are we gonna do next? This is kind of scary. And then there's a, a person with a background like mine, and then there's a someone with an MFA in theater. And if it's our colleague, Lydia, she's wrapped in scarves and seems very dramatic and uses her hands a lot, which might make it feel even more intimidating, but she's so funny and kind. And we get you up on your feet and we have you looking at each other and doing simple exercises to connect. A lot of work in pairs, a lot of partnership work. And really what we're doing is building different muscles. What does it mean to really pay attention to someone? What does it mean to really hear them, to listen, to be present, to make sure you've understood? And what happens over the course of the day through these different exercises? We put you through an exercise and then we have you stop and reflect. What did you take from that? What did you learn from it? People then vocalize that. And we then think about well, what, what in principle did you experience here? Like maybe it's about making eye contact or learning to hear uh, how someone feels beneath what they say, <laughs> because how you feel and what you say could be two very different things. So looking to read, is someone interested in you? Do they want to learn more? Are they saying they do, but their eyes are saying something else? And then thinking about how to apply those principles. So everything we do is scaffolded in that way where it starts with an experience, a debrief, and then an application. A lot of times when you get in a classroom, you've got a PowerPoint and a laser pointer, and we're gonna tell you what you need to know. I love, Alan Alda has this line, he says, maybe it's not his, but he says this, power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. <laughs> We really want to flip this and make this an experiential um, way of way of learning so that you you remember you remember things in your body and emotionally. It this is all it all operates under the premise that we are feeling beings who also happen to think rather than rational beings who also happen to feel. Um, there's some really nice research out there, and I can't remember the exact statistic on this, but the amount of what we remember based on what someone says versus on how they, they make you feel, it's pretty significant. People remember how you make them feel. If you know that famous Maya Angelou quote, people will never remember exactly the words that you said, but they will always remember how you make them feel. That's really what we're, we're putting into practice. So over the course of the day, it builds and we, we bring you through different, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a book with you in a moment. I think if you haven't, if you haven't seen this book, it's a really great book to read. What we do is we build certain tactics. <laughs> so the book is Strategic Science Communication. Have any of you seen this by Anthony Dudo and John Besley? Marianne, have you had a chance to read it yet? It's really um, great. It's really yeah, great. I saw Dudo give a presentation recently and I put it on my list to buy. <laughs> yeah, it's really great book. And, and what he's doing, what they're doing is they're saying, 
we need to we need to approach science communication from the vantage point of strategy. You know, we need to be there's this is really worth your your group would enjoy reading this book. So what are the key things that we're after? If our our goal really is behavior change, <laughs> what are the tactics that we're using to get there? And one of you before, I can't remember who it was, was talking about how it feels like a performance, how communication feels like a performance, and you have to change that performance based on who the audience is, was was that? Oh, that was me. Yes, thank you, Andrea. Yes, yes. Um, I think you would find this book particularly useful because it talks about how we have different tactics to be able to reach different audiences. We have to think about the overall goals of what we're trying to achieve. Are we trying to get someone to get vaccinated? Are we trying to get them to vote to support science? These are very particular goals that we then achieve through tactics. So a lot of the work that we're doing in the, in the ALDA workshops is helping people to learn how to build trust, which I think is absolutely critical to any form of success in science communication. And that how you do that with different audiences is gonna vary. So what it, what it does is, and I, I don't wanna take away the punchline, I do hope you do a workshop with us at some point, but over the course of the day, we wind up asking the participants Hey, in this communication where you're the leader and the other person's the follower, who bears more responsibility? You know, if you think about it, if you're the teacher versus the student, is it the student's responsibility to keep up with the teacher or is it the teacher's fundamental responsibility to make sure, that, sure the students are with them? I think in great pedagogy, it's the latter because the instructor or the communicator is serving, is serving the people who need to follow them. So a lot of these exercises through improv invite you to put yourself in the shoes of your audience to the best of your ability. We can never fully transport ourselves, but we can imagine what it feels like to be someone else. What they might know, what they might not know, what they might care about, what they might not care about. And that listening is absolutely critical to that enterprise. Because if you're not asking and not paying attention, you're probably going to miss the mark. So I'm going to share the, and, and those of you who've done improv, this is going to be old hat to you, the two principles of improv. If you imagine this as, and I tried to do this, tried to do this in my family life, at work, it's not always easy, but to apply the two fundamental principles of improv. And the first one is, you have to say yes and. That means you may be talking with someone who you disagree with. Maybe it's about climate. Maybe it's about vaccinations. You may see things very, very different. If you want that relationship to continue, that scene to go on, you've got to say yes and find a way to add to it. Rather than just say, this is stupid. I don't like you. I don't want this conversation. Boom, game over, tilt. So that's the first principle that we use improv exercises to help build, build muscle for. How do you say yes and in a situation where you may not be on the same? To me, this actually comes down to acknowledging the dignity of other people and respecting their difference and being curious about it rather than judgmental. This is where it gets hard at home. I say to my son, Mika, take the garbage out and the garbage doesn't go out. He's perfectly capable of understanding that, take the garbage out. There, there's a mismatch between what I've said and what he has or hasn't heard and what he does with that, with that information. So I've got to figure out a way to say yes and, and keep that scene going if I want him to take the garbage out. The second principle is to make your partner look good. And this one may almost be Harder. Tyler, so you you do stage work with improv? Do you get up and do scenes? So what happens if you're on the stage with someone and you choose not to make your partner look good? Hey, it will it'll kill the scene. Um, I think which is also why I do more stand-up because I need to practice more of making <laughs> sure that I, I uh, keep in mind to make my partner look good instead of just myself. But it's 
yeah, it's like, so because because sometimes a yes and in the scene is a no, but just because someone has, especially in like the improv scene, has said something that you don't agree with, you can't just say, well, no, that's not a sandwich. It's actually like a notebook. And it's, well, come on. <laughs> you know, um, I just lost that last piece, the screen where you said, it's not a sandwich, it's a notebook. It's, yeah. So, and it's just, um, it's, especially with improv, it's a lot easier to practice yes ending because at the end of the day, at the end of an improv scene, it's over and it's fantastic because it existed, not because it was anything else. Um, and the more you can practice that in these low stakes situations, I think the easier it is, especially with like our science communication um, and especially with a lot more uh, uh, tenuous topics. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, and I love what you you put in the um, the chat, uh, the improv. You teach uh, teach at structures classes with two main goals: taking care of yourself and taking care of your scene partner. It, it's it's really a different way of saying say yes and and make your partner look good. So. Really, those two principles are so critical to building empathy, listening, hearing, and, and demonstrating care for your partner. I really feel this piece of dignity is at the core of so much of what it means to be a great partner in the scenes of life. And even if you disagree with someone, you can, any of you who's at, who've ever supervised someone or God forbid, have to let someone go from the job. That's a terrible thing. There are ways that you can have difficult conversations or interactions, but do that with a sense of a dignity and value for the other, the other person. So there's a mindset related to improv that I think is particularly important and impactful. And it's what sold me to come to the Alda Center in 2016 and then continue and stay on. Um, maybe I will pause here. I'd like to. I'd like to make sure that we have a chance to talk about things that are important to you. I've thrown a, a lot of general concepts, but what would be useful to you on this on this call that you'd like to talk or learn more about? Hi, Laura, I'll just chip in uh, if folks are feeling shy today, maybe one or two tips that people can try with a friend you know when they're if they're thinking about trying to get warmed up maybe for a workshop sometime for all the center you know how can they practice yes and yeah um i'm tempted and i could follow up and share this with you uh there's there's a lot of improv exercises out there in the world and part of me is tempted to say you can try these on your own. I'm not, I, do, I wouldn't want you to experience them in such a way that you wind up saying, oh, this is not particularly effective. Um, so there is something to be said about working pe with people who are really skilled in this and who know how to debrief these exercises. Um, that being said, there's one I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage you to take a look at that a lot of people who've gone through our workshops will then go and use in their labs. And it's a it's a tactic. So to come back to this idea of strategic communication and the tactics, it's a tactic you can use to learn how to distill your message. So distilling may be a good idea. It may not be. Sometimes you want to expand an idea. Sometimes you want to distill it down. So this is a game called Half-Life. And the way, have you done this? I see you shaking some heads. So the way that this exercise works is I, as the facilitator, would have you break into pairs. And then, Marianne, let me just use you and Tyler as an example. I'm not going to have you actually go through this, but I'll pretend that the two of you are sitting across each other. And I'm going to say, Marianne, you're person A. Tyler is person B. Tyler, <laughs> yeah, you get the crown. Tyler, your role right now is to listen. Marianne, I'm going to give you, and I would give you, a minute or two minutes to share an idea. Maybe it's the first part of a talk you want to give. You, you could set the parameters for this. And I'm going to tell you stop at the end of a minute. OK, and then we would say go. And Mariette, you would do your thing. And then Tyler would give you some feedback. 
about what she heard or didn't hear and what she understood. And then we would say, okay, now we're gonna cut that in half. Now you're gonna have 30 seconds for this. Think about what you wanna prioritize. We're, we're basically teaching you to communicate so that you'll be heard <laughs> rather than you thinking you know what you wanna say. You're, you're able to bounce this off your partner. Mm -hmm. So then we'd give you another 30 seconds and you'd do it again. And then Tyler would give you feedback and say, I was a little confused this time, or that was great. Maybe put this at the beginning. That really stuck with me. Did I, did I understand that correctly? So you basically debrief it together. And then we come back and guess what? We cut it in half again and give you 15 seconds. And we say, what can you get? What can you say in 15 seconds? You get, get a headline and a punchline on your market set, go. And then you do that 15 seconds. We debrief a little and then we give you a whole luxurious minute back and what do you know that minute feels really long compared yeah. to time and you realize how if i if i then switched you mariette from tyler to ben ben would hear it very differently so you learn that each audience has different needs and that it's incumbent upon you to do some homework about that audience to try and test messages out before you just run wild with them. And to understand you might have to reshape them and to look for, is my audience member with me? Am I making them look good in the way that I'm communicating so that they're coming along with me? So that's the kind of improv. I mean, it doesn't sound like crazy stand up, right? It's two people sitting together, hashing through different versions of a message to see what works and what doesn't work. One of the things about improv that I think is so compelling is it makes you get creative. So we have an exercise called hobby speed dating. We have people sit. is it helpful if I explain this? Yeah? Okay. So we have a group of you sit in an inner circle facing out and then your partners are facing you and you take turns with the partner linking your work to their hobby. So one group is a group of hobbyists, one is a group of scientists. So maybe, Ben, what's your research area again? Uh, we'll, we'll say using CT scans to be biomarkers at a population health level. Okay, so maybe if you were sitting across from me and I said, my hobby is cooking, you'd have two minutes to try to frame your work in a way that would have relevance to my hobby and it's basically a it's a it's a speed dating kind of exercise we would do that and then you would switch to a new partner who might be a knitter <laughs> and then you'd have to figure out how to make some connections some of them are going to be great some of them aren't but it's like this generative creative process that gets you thinking about the work you do how you do it why you do it the problems it tries to address, um, how it works, things you need to understand about it. It gets you thinking about it in different paradigms and you come up with different language in a very creative way to communicate about it. And what's neat is, you know, you see some of it flops like, oh, that was not a good analogy. That didn't work. And other times it's like, wow, I never thought of describing my work that way. And it really lands and it gives me a whole new way, not just to communicate about my work, but actually to think about how I do it. So the process of communication itself, and one of the values of improv, is that it, it, it has you step back and think more creatively about what you do and why you do it and what purpose it serves. To me, that's the best possible outcome. It's great, obviously, to share information, and be able to communicate effectively with others. But if it, if it can also help you on top of that, become more generative in the work that you do, that's, that's amazing, really amazing. Someone, yes, Mariette said, I like how that helps you frame ideas in a way that someone else will be able to start to grasp. Um, one of the key things that scientists who come away, and I say scientists, I mean STEM professionals, but really this kind of training works for anybody dealing in areas of work that are complex and hard to understand if you haven't grown up in that culture. Um, Alan Alda loves the concept and we do too here at the center of the curse of knowledge. Y'all heard this idea? 
So it's the idea that not that knowledge is bad, but that you suffer from a curse of knowledge when you know something so well, you forget what it feels like not to know it anymore. You forget a time when you didn't understand statistics or uh, you know different technologies you work with. And when you lose that distance, you tend to communicate about your work in a very narrow way. That makes it harder for people who don't have the same background as you. So this whole exercise of empathy, being able to the best of your ability to place yourself in someone else's shoes, it reminds you what you have to take into consideration when you're communicating so that an actual human connection can take place. Other a question for you. Um, sure. I, you know, like you've been doing this work for many years at this point, but it's still in like the whole scientific community, probably a novel idea. How have you been able to get funding to continue to support your your research and outreach? Yeah. Oh my gosh, goodness, that's a really um, that's a really good question, and it's. First of all, we're at Stony Brook University, which is great because it means I have some fundamental funding streams to support this work. Second of all, it did not hurt to have a guy like Alan Alda pounding the pavement, helping to raise money, getting some endowment together and, and getting other people to uh, understand science communication was important. So it's interesting, I, I, I hosted a woman, um, from Taiwan at the center for a month and got to spend a lot of time with her, just really wonderful person who's connecting journalists and scientists with each other. And she said, I don't know how to get this going in my, in my country. And I thought, we were really, really lucky that someone like Alan Alda came up with this idea, talked about it and brought people on board. And he's gotten all kinds of awards. Um, I realize this doesn't directly answer your question, but money and resources are about what people value money is a sim symbolic statement of value i'm not saying it's not an actual and important one but i think it helped to change the tide in the u.s when the national academies and aaas and other organizations like this honored alan so we have funding from different sources we have like i said fundamental underwriting for certain things from Stony Brook. We have some endowment. Um, there are foundations, just like the ones that I think Rita Allen and Burroughs Welcome have supported this initiative, right, Marriott? I saw that on your website. So there are foundations that will give shorter term funds to do projects. Um, we've had funding to, for example, design a training specifically focused on climate science. They're very, there's a whole, I would be remiss if I didn't, share with you there's a whole body of literature called the science of science communication that helps us understand it's not all science plays the same way with all people depending on who you are your background your experiences you have a very different yes thank you the oxford handbook of science of science communication excellent and a number of journals like science communication and then another one I actually didn't put these here for you guys. They are on my desk. <laughs> Public understanding of science. Um, there's this really, really interesting and robust body of literature that looks at different audiences, different topics in science, and how perceptions vary, and how the strategies and tactics you use have to vary as well. So Ben, the last piece of this is we actually sell workshops at the Alda Center. We train, um, we, we do probably 150 trainings a year. We work with universities, colleges, nonprofits, for-profits, um, federal agencies, labs. We do a lot of work with NASA, Department of Defense, um, you name it. There, there are so many organizations out there that do work in STEM that need help. And they come to us, they, they often, they used to find out about us because of Alan through his podcast. I think that we've moved into a phase, and Marietta, I'd be curious to hear what you think about this, uh, especially with your Scientific American background and the work you're now doing as a sister dean up there in Boston. Yay! You know, I think the world in the US has changed around this. I think 
we don't have to justify anymore. When I first came into the Alda Center, we would go in to do workshops and we would say, why is science communication important? And we'd have to let people own that. We don't have to do that anymore. It's very rare there's a scientist in the room who thinks this is a waste of time. As a matter of fact, I see more and more organizations like this one, classes at universities, you know, people growing their own approach to training because they realize we've got to do something about this. We cannot leave this up to chance. Marriott, is this similar to your experience? Yeah, I was just uh, I was just putting in the chat. I I've never in 30 years, more than 30 years in science journalism, seen this much energy from the science community around, um, you know, around in really truly engaging the public and not just decept the difference now too is not just disseminating the products of science, but actually bi-directional engagement or civic science, you know, which I I hear bounced around a lot, but I, I, I think it's a real thing this time. And, and it, it's got a lot of energy. And as you say, Laura, foundation support, and that's terrific. Yes. So Ben, does that help to answer your, your question? Yeah, very much, thanks. Um, one of the things we've done here, I should mention, I'm also Dean of the School of Communication and, and Journalism, and we've started new degree programs that are about science communication and journalism, because I think it's important to professionalize this work. Um, it's, it's, it's one thing to do science communication training, it's another thing to do it really, really well, based in the literature which is why, you know, I, you can absolutely look up some improv exercise and have exercises and have some fun with this and see what it produces. I have people who've been doing theater for 30 years, uh, working in really sophisticated ways. And we, it takes us months and months and months to train people to be certified instructors, because I don't want to put anybody out there who's not really prepared to deal with some of the challenges or pushback that you get in the room. And, and I know that if we don't do our work well, it could backlash against science communication. And I take that very, very seriously. So we have a really robust training and assessment program that we, that we work through before we put people on the road. Tyler, thank you for putting those um, references in here. So it does help that organizations like the National Academies and others have gotten behind us. I think it's it's driven a lot of change in the US. Are you all familiar with PCST, Public Communication of Science and Technology? Are you all familiar with this conference? Let me see if I can pull it up here. It's an organization that meets every other year. I, I was thrilled to be able to go. Um, it was in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Um, and a number of Americans were there. Public communication. And you realize there's a lot of work going around the world. It's a global network for science communication. They have some really neat online resources. I'm gonna post it in the chat for you so you can have a look. There's people who are practitioners, researchers, trainers, all of the above that are involved in this network. Um, you can become a member. It's a really neat group. And there were, there were a number of events at the conference this year that were about using different applications of theater and science communication. If you wanna have a look at that for a moment. So I, I'd encourage you to look at that. And then Tyler, you mentioned the link. Is everybody here in this group familiar with that? Would it be worth, I'm gonna put this in here. We have an online platform. We're actually in the process of redesigning this website this summer. This is not about the Alda Center per se, but it is about linking knowledge with action. It's about, linking the science of science communication and learning science with the practice of science communication. Um, and it's a, it's a great place. It's, we designed it when we started this and we had funding from Cavley to support it. Rita Allen has supported it. We're really grateful 
for, for that. You can't get these things off the ground without foundations that care. But I always had in my head, you know, the conversation, are you familiar with the conversation that really helps create bridges around important topics? Um, this was a little bit that idea of what if we were to get people in science communication to be able to write pieces or produce whiteboard animation or videos or interviews that help bring the, the research on science communication and best practices in it to, to a practical application. So feel free to dig around in here. It's um, if you are interested in publishing something, it doesn't have to be a written piece. It could be there's podcasts, all kinds of uh, ways to to link science communication research with practice. We would be thrilled to have you submit. We've had classes submit projects on here, and I I realize it needs to be a bit redesigned. We it grew fast. There's a lot of content in there, and we're going to be tagging things slightly different. But you can get a sense. Like there's one in there, including people with disabilities and the process of uh, tech development starts by addressing techno ableism. So there's just lots of really cool, inspired work in here. And again, I invite you to contribute as well. You're more than welcome to drop me a line if you want to learn more. Our editor, Elise. My gosh, there's like 15 pages of content in here. So <laughs> every time I look at it, there's something new. What else are you curious about? What else could I be of help with? What do you find challenging in this work? I've Hello. got another question, but I'll wait. Go ahead. Hello, hi, I joined a little late, um, but I was just checking out the links. Um, I'm interested in, um, so I'm a science new civic science fellow. So I'm interested in like finding ways to like show my work. It's about um, audiences and how to engage younger audiences in science using science journalism. And then I was looking on a website, some of this stuff seems like it aligns um, with my project. Um, so I would like help with that. Mary, oh well, congratulations. Can you tell Thank me, you. Martina, can you tell me a little bit more about the project that you're going to be doing as a civic science fellow? I'm so inspired by this initiative. Thank you. Yeah. So you can find more details on the website, but basically in a nutshell, is that um, my project is about focusing on how to use science journalism to gauge younger audiences in science. And to do that, um, I decided to, you know, have eight focus groups with um 44 teens to see how they view science, news, and journalism. Um, and from there, I was able to decide, okay, this is how young people, Gen Z, see science. Um, and then I made a four-part series on TikTok as a video report because the teens said they like to use TikTok. Um, so I shared it on TikTok. It got like a good amount of views. Like I think about at, on average a thousand something views per wow. video. Um, and then from there, um, my colleagues and I at Science News and Science News Explorers, um, we decided that we're going to do different TikTok experiments. So last week we published um, Why Are Giraffes Tongues Blue as a text screen TikTok. And then we had some other TikToks coming up. Neat. That is fan. For my camera, on, but I don't know how it's looking. I'm on my iPad. Marriott, just put like Marriott. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Well, congratulations. Hello. This is neat. Mary, I just put the link to your Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Um, I'm also going to put in here, so just to build on this, this idea of, you know, you want to know what your goal is. You also know, you want to know more about the audience you're trying to reach. What do they need? What do they want? What's going to get them engaged? What are you hoping that they will do? It's, I'm going to plug their book again. You can tell Anthony and John, I did that. This is such a good guide to making you think structurally through what it is you're trying to do with your communication. You know, be, use your time wisely. Use your time and resources wisely to be very deliberate and strategic. One of the sources out there, and Mariette, you know Chris Volpe as well, is Science Counts. I put the link directly into his research page this is an organization that looks at how Americans perceive science. If science 
at a brand, Chris Volpe has concluded, most of my Americans, you say science and they think hope. But depending on who you are, hope means something different. He's broken this down by different audiences. This is a really nice set of tools to get a better idea of who you're trying to reach. It's not going to give you anything, everything you need, but it could help you narrow down the playing field so you get a better sense of who's this group I'm trying to connect with. There, we did a lot of work with Chris around different areas of Mississippi. Um, it just was an interesting connection. We had a series of workshops down in Mississippi and what are people's perceptions of science? What might get them engaged? What would turn them off? How does that vary depending on whether you live in a more rural or urban area? Um, are you male or female? What other background factors, your education, et cetera, et cetera, contribute to how you perceive and might engage with or not? So I'd encourage you to take a look at this as just one of many sources that can help you refine who are you trying to reach and why would they care about what you want them to do? <laughs> So that it turns that responsibility toward you to be a, a, a leader, a, a leader in communication who's taking seriously the needs of, of others when you're designing strategies. And I think Marriott, you would know this better than I do. This is what journalists do so well, right? They know their audiences and they know how to create content that helps those audiences get what they need when they need it and how. Journalists I know, I think strategic communicators do this too, but many journalists I know have a picture of a particular person or persons in their head that they're writing to, which helps. Yeah, it does. Um, one question you might have about improv, it sounds like a lot of interpersonal communication and verbal. And that's true, and that's how we train in it, but it works for writing as well, for exactly the reason Marriott just named, which is when you're writing, imagine who that audience is. We even, Alan has this funny thing that he taught me to do. He taught me how to, taught me how to speak to a camera. Have you ever, have you ever done a, done a, just like a, the camera's cold on you and you're supposed to talk and you're like, right? It's really, really hard. We actually had someone back when we did the flame challenge who would put little eyelashes and like a mouth on the bottom of the camera. So it felt like a person and it changes the way you interact with the camera to imagine it's a real Person. So Alan taught me how to speak to a teleprompter. He literally stood behind it and said, talk to me, not to the camera. And it forever shifted the way that um, I'm able to do that. It really helped. So yes, improv works for writing as well. Let me see what's in the link here. You've always wondered why they don't put a photo of a baby or something on there. I'd want a photo of a puppy because I talk to my dog. Yeah, so. that'd be fine. But you, you end up in a, you know, sometimes in a little room by yourself with this, just this camera with a red light. And it's no wonder people look wooden on the air. It's really true. And it takes an incredible amount of work to learn how to overcome that. When you watch 20 takes of yourself, 19 of which are horrible, and you finally got it on the 20th one, you realize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's how I felt when I did the videos and I was looking at them I did like so many takes that all the takes started to look the same <laughs> <laughs> and then when you edit the videos and then it was good having like another person look at it because they could see and sometimes we just more harsh on ourselves yeah so you're like okay do I look weird and then they're like no it's fine <laughs> no that's so that's great statement and to me that it can be the exact same words in each take. The, the feelings that you convey are ultimately what matters. And especially being, oh, let me say something else about improv that I think is important. This is not about pretending to be someone you're not. It's actually facilitating more of who you are and helping you be really genuine. You guys know, you can sniff out when someone's trying to, trying to, uh, pitch something to you they don't really believe in themselves. You can tell when someone's being disingenuous. This is about, it's not about turning scientists into sales people. It's about helping you become more of who you are, um, becoming more of a genuine communicator and, and 
studies that we're doing about the Alden method, we see people's confidence and their ability to connect with others go up. And I, I think that's a really important measure. When you feel like you're better at it, you actually are better at it and you're more likely to want to do it more. And you probably focus less on feeling judged and more on that feeling of making a connection with other human beings and getting information and ideas out there that, that need to be part of our public dialogue. And that won't be if you don't do it. I'm taking a look at the time here. What, what else would you care to discuss? I, I have a, another question, but I can wait unless other people have some too. I don't want to seal the spotlight. Oh, I was just going to share um, an exercise we had done in one of my improv classes, um, especially with the emotion was um, they gave us all a feelings wheel, which was good for other reasons as well. Um, and we would have to just say a phrase like the dog went out today, um, but uh, embodying one of those feelings and just repeat it over and over until it stopped <laughs> feeling like silly. Um, and sometimes uh, you would just be screaming, the dog went out today for um, a very long minute, <laughs> especially for um, like an emotion or a feeling that you are not necessarily accustomed to. Um, but it's a lot of, it's, it's really good for practicing, um, especially when you are having to like talk to a camera or uh, express emotion um, without, you know, someone else being there or without that emotion being um, kind of like thrust upon you. Mm, that is a great exercise. I love that. I don't know if any of you are in New York. Isabel, Isabella Rossellini, famous actor. She did this show that I got to see at Cold Spring Harbor. And the opening scene is this, this old silent movie and she's acting it out alongside and speaking lines that are not exactly the same lines that would have been in the original movie. But she goes through this multiple times and each time it's a different, it's a different relationship and a different feeling. Just absolutely fascinating. So it's like a more extended version. And she did this like five or six times with the same black and white silent film clip. Really neat, I love that. Ben, you were gonna. Yeah, I guess this is a question for you, Laura, and then also you, Mariette, if you have uh, thoughts on this, like were the workshops um, like built into the vision of the Science Communication Institute or was that something built later on? Um, yeah. I'm part of, so I'm at UW-Madison, we have life science communication, we've got great people working uh, here, but it's a lot of like within the department and not a lot yeah. of applied stuff yet. And that'd be great if that happened. So you must, are you connected at all with Todd Newman? Uh, we've chatted. I can't say we're best friends by any means, but yeah. uh, we know each other. Todd spent a year at the Alda Center. So please say hi for me. We're so fond of him. Um, they do great work in that, in that unit. How about I tell you the origin story of the center? Because that I think that'll, that'll pull it together. So Alan Alda, you might say, why was he interested in science? He was on MASH. He loves science. He's super curious. Marriott, you've seen this. You've seen him in action with his curiosity around science firsthand. And he wound up on PBS's Scientific American Frontiers for 11 years. And he actually told me in the beginning when he started interviewing, he would do all this homework and he'd get really knowledgeable. And he'd come in there and he'd have all these tough questions and, and it was terrible. And the director pulled him aside and said, don't try to know what they do, be curious. And, and it got him thinking about, he's, he said, my greatest gift is my God-given ignorance. <laughs> and he realized if he were just to come in and ask questions, he could pull these stories out of scientists and their work was just crazy interesting to people because of how he was interacting with them. At one point he had a woman on camera and he would notice that she would be talking just fine with him and then it's like she saw the camera. 
and she froze. And he said it, he felt like the white, the white lab coat went on. And then he kind of coaxed her back and got her conversational with him. And then she'd notice the camera again and she'd freeze. And he thought, geez, I wonder if we could um, use the only training I had as a young actor, improv, to help scientists get more comfortable with communicating. He went around to a bunch of universities. This must have been, I don't know, 2006, 2007, something like that, 2008. And Stony Brook University on Long Island said, you know what, we'll give that a try. We think that's interesting. So it really started with the workshops to answer your question. It didn't start with the Center for Communicating Science. It started with the idea that, wow, if we used improv with scientists, it might help them communicate better. And it worked. And people felt that. And it went, I mean, I could show you, I could show you charts like the first year they did like maybe five workshops, then they did maybe 15. By the time I walked in the door in 2016, they were doing 85 a year, had no business plan. And it was like, wow, how do we manage this? So um, now we're up somewhere in 150, 180. I don't know. We do a lot of workshops. I have a pretty big team. They're busy all the time. They teach courses, but they're doing a lot of work on the road. So it started with that rather with, than with the, the study. And it, it didn't start with coursework. We've gone back and built that because of the popularity of the workshops. I think that will have to be our last question. Um, uh, thank you all for attending this month's mentor chat. Thank you, Laura, for spending this time with us in our community. Um, everyone, our 2023 mentor chat series is all booked up, as I've said. Um, you received our schedule. Um, you will get another one for our July. So just keep an eye out for the rest of the year. Um, and thank you again to everyone who sent in suggestions. Um, if, there, if any of you have any more guests that you would like to chat with, feel free to send them my way because we'll keep this series going for as long as we exist. Um, our July mentor chat will be all about applying for grants for your science communication projects with uh, Cecilia Lalama. So for those of you who are, uh, you now know how to connect with your audiences, we will hopefully have a conversation that will help you find more money so you can connect with more of your audiences. Um, and with that, thank you again. Thank you, it was a pleasure. I really enjoyed getting a chance to meet all of you.